So the Democratic National Convention is, of course, taking place in Chicago months before the presidential election. Uh, the nominee, of course, Kamala Harris. Uh, the Democrats at the moment are refusing, at the time we're broadcasting or doing this interview, to put a Palestinian speaker on the stage. Now, this is something which they're under growing pressure over. Now, there's no better person to speak to about this and just generally what's happening at the convention and the Democrats on this issue with than Tarek Habash, who's the first political appointee of the Biden administration to resign over Israel's genocidal onslaught. And I should also mention he is Palestinian American, um, which is more than relevant given what we're talking about. Hey, Tarek, how you doing? Hey, Owen. Great to, great to be here. Um, could just explain, I mean, refusing to have a Palestinian speaker. We had uh, two parents of an Israeli hostage um, their pain was on stage, their suffering. Um, and they mentioned in that, um, the, you know, the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza, but no Palestinian on the stage to talk about that. What, just tell us about that and what that actually represents. Yeah, I mean, it represents the Democratic Party and its continuation of erasing the Palestinian identity from the moment, from the party, from American society. There are so many Palestinian Americans who have felt so much pain, indescribable pain every single day for the last 10 months. And I think likewise, there are many Israelis and American Jews and really just Americans across the country who have felt pain for the Israeli families who have suffered as well. And I don't mm -hmm. think that anyone is upset that Israeli families who um, had an opportunity to express that pain yesterday. I think it's just the reality that Palestinians continue to be the ones that have to sacrifice, who continue to be dehumanized, who continue to be erased by this political party, by this political infrastructure in the United States, uh, whether Democrat or Republican. On one hand, you have a Republican nominee who calls pal Palestinians, uses the term Palestinian as a slur. On the other hand, you have a Democratic Party that's supposed to be a big tent, that's supposed to represent every facet of America that continuously refuses to acknowledge the harm that has befallen the Palestinian people because of American weapons, because of American tax dollars, because of this administration's refusal to change course, to change policy, to enforce our own laws. It's not a big ask. Let's enforce our own laws when it comes to the weapons that we are providing to an ally. Let's make sure that these weapons are not used for war crimes. Let's make sure that we're protecting civilian life. We're not even doing that. It's a bare minimum. I mean, you resigned at the beginning of this year, and clearly Joe Biden's administration up to its neck, arming, supporting aid, political diplomatic support. Do you think there's been any tangible progress now he's gone with Kamala Harris? What do you think when people say, or, or do you think there's a bit of a, this is all a bit of a wing and a prayer, people just hoping something might turn up under her presidency rather than something substantive? I mean, listen, Joe Biden ideologically has a problem with being able to even show any empathy toward Palestinians. So the fact that the candidate that's running for office is anyone other than Joe Biden is a huge success. I don't want to discount that at all. But we're 10 months into a genocide, 10 months plus. We continue to send weapons unconditionally to an Israeli government that has proven that they are not interested in returning Israeli or Palestinian hostages, that they are interested in continuing the genocide, continuing the starvation of millions of Palestinians, continuing the ethnic cleansing. And we are okay with that. And that's Unfortunately, it's not enough just to have a change in tone, to be more humanizing of Palestinians, which I think even just the events of the last week come call into question whether the Democratic Party is actually humanizing Palestinians. But the reality is we need real substantive policy action. We need to enforce our own laws. We need to actually take steps to protect Palestinian lives right now, not in six months, not in three months, right now. I mean, just to be a bit brutal, um, I mean, it's easy for me to say this, although the consequences of the US presidential election, we all suffer the consequences. This is the last, it's the only hegemon on the planet, so we all suffer the consequences. I understand the desperation to stop Trump, but do you think some US progressives who've genuinely shown distress about the genocidal onslaught on Gaza 
have become start to behave a bit like this is all a bit of an inconvenience. Yeah, you know, they're desperate to get rid of Trump. That's become the overriding priority. And the issue of Gaza, of Palestine, is just being relegated by a lot of people. Yeah, and I think it's short-sighted. I think what we know is that genocide is one of the worst things that could happen to any society. And I think when you justify or you excuse it, even because there are other existential risks, you create the likelihood and the possibility that that genocide could extend beyond the region that it is facing. And you're essentially saying if it is okay to happen to Palestinians in Palestine and Gaza right now, who's to say that it won't happen to some other community, maybe even here in the United States. And that doesn't only become a risk if it's Donald Trump, that becomes a risk when you normalize it. Just a couple of other things, because I know you're speaking. Um... Do you think, I mean, in terms of at the moment, there are certain states like Michigan and elsewhere where there are, where we don't know Trump has a good chance of winning. It depends actually on people turning out in the Democratic coalition, including Palestinian Americans, including Muslim Americans, including younger progressives and progressives in general who just don't like genocide. Do yeah. you think, what do you think about the prospect, given where the Democrats are currently at, of many of those simply just whatever being told, screamed, you've got to do this because of Trump. It doesn't matter how much they get that yelled at. They just yeah. won't be able to bring themselves to vote for the Democrats. Yeah. What do you think? How, how, think, how, where are we at with that? I think it's a real risk. And I think one of the reasons why the uncommitted movement is so important right now is because they're actually trying to do Democrats a favor. It's not only that they are horrified by, what, by what's happening, but they also know that Democrats can be better and should be better particularly on hum human rights. It's consistent with the Democratic Party's vision for America. It's consistent with the Democratic Party's vision for the world. And there are people who would like to support Kamala Harris and a Democrat, but there are real dangers if there is not an effort to actually show that Democrats are going to be any different moving forward. And when it actually comes to policy, when it comes to substance, when it comes to voters, we know based on data, the Institute for Middle East Understanding just came out with new polls in battleground states um, in Georgia, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, and other states. It's not just Michigan. It's not just Arabs. It's not just Palestinian Americans. It is multiracial. It's multi-ethnic. It's multi-generational. There is a coalition of people who believe that this issue defines the future of America, not just foreign policy wise, not just on a global stage, but domestically as well. And there are a lot of people who would very clearly have a much stronger ability to support a Democratic candidate like Kamala Harris in November if policy changed, if we used American leverage to achieve a permanent and lasting ceasefire. And that means, unfortunately, for Americans, as hard as it might be, enforcing our laws and preventing the continuation of weapons to flow to an Israeli government that continues to commit genocide. And just very finally, Gideon Levy, the very courageous Israeli journalist I've interviewed him, he doesn't have much hope. I have to say, for Israel at the moment. His hope, he thinks, is in the US with public opinion shifting. It used to be the case that just criticising Israel and American society was pretty much verboten, very difficult. That's changed. Polling shows more Americans than not think genocide has been committed. That's a huge shift. Most oppose the military onslaught, which is one euphemistic way of putting it. Do you think public attitudes have now shifted and are shifting to the extent where a permanent shift is plausible that Israel won't be able to just get loads of our weapons, aid and support whilst it behaves our wishes. Yes, absolutely. And I actually think that American politicians are behind American public opinion. Um, they have not actually realized how much American public opinion has shifted. We've seen it at the convention. Anytime someone mentions Gaza, mentions ceasefire, mentions Palestinians, there are loud applauses because even people in the Democratic base recognize the importance of this issue, recognize the importance of Democrats to be right on this. It's not just the ceasefire coalition. It's everyone. It's a big tent issue. We all have to be on the right side of this. And I think that the political incentives need to also shift because our politicians are moving too slowly and it's costing support. It's fragmenting the base and it's fragmenting American society. Zach, it's been a massive honor. And um, it's very difficult, I have to say. I can't imagine what it's like to witness the genocide taking place whilst also having to be gaslit, the erasure, just the complete open contempt for the value of Palestinian life expressed 
including by people who call themselves progressive, nauseating stuff. Uh, for those watching, just like, subscribe, leave your comments as ever, um, but share, share this video, get Tarek's voice out. But Tarek, honestly, what an honor. Lovely to speak to you. Thanks so much, Owen.